like the best <laughs> is Henry Geis. <laughs> job but Henry yeah. is outstanding in his field. <laughs> no argument there, no argument there. So but if you would like to do your own humanist minute please uh, come see me. I'd like to hear your thoughts and uh, see what you have to share to the rest of us. And at this time I'd like to invite Pam Heward, our program director, to introduce our speaker. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about her. Charlotte Schertz graduated with a master's degree in anthropology and migration from the United University of Oxford, one of the few universities in the world that specializes in refugee studies. Charlotte is a native of France and migrated to the U.S. in her late teens. She is an adjunct faculty of anthropology at Chandler Gilbert Community College and is currently leading research on the driving gender gap among refugees resettled in the metro Phoenix area. When she isn't involved in academic work, Charlotte is an advocate with the Lutheran Social Services where she writes about campaign and lobbies for refugees. She is also the mother of three two uh, three and a half year old twin boys and a what is it one year old one and a half, one and a half year old and, and she also teaches a class in uh, world religions I mean we, we had a nice time to chat and her parents are joining us thank you for coming so please help me welcome Charlotte Schertz and she's going to speak to us today about what you should know about the current global refugee crisis please help me welcome Charlotte Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here and to talk to you about um, uh, the work that I've been doing for a little bit of time uh, with refugees and for uh, about the work that Lutheran Social Services um, does. Um, as Pam said, I'm an advocate for refugees and I've been doing work about refugees and for refugees um, in different capacities for a few years now. Um, I would invite you, so it's, I, probably first I should tell you about what we'll be reviewing today. Oh, I hope the slides will look fine. Anyways, I looked a little bit off here, but uh, first I'll tell you about Refugee Resettlement 101, that's what we call. I've given that lecture to different uh, groups in different situations um, because we feel that it's important for people to know more about what the current refugee crisis is about and to kind of... Um, I think highlight some of the um, um, most common misconceptions that people seem to have about refugees. So we'll go over that, then I'll tell you a little bit about LSS. I'll call it LSS because I feel that Lutheran Social Services of the Southwest is way too much of a mouthful for me to repeat over and over again. So I'll just call them LSS. I'll tell you a little bit about how you can get involved. It's a bit of the silver lining here. And then we'll have time for questions. Um, I would invite you, however, to uh, ask questions as you have them. I feel that the uh, lecture has so many different points, so many different issues and challenges that it's more useful if you ask a question as you have it. Uh, and then if you forget one, then we'll have time to talk about it uh, even more after because we'll have a Q&A. So <laughs> let me tell you first about Lutheran Social Services of the Southwest, or um, LSS. So we are um, an agency, a nonprofit, uh, that works in seven different counties in Arizona, and we serve mainly uh, vulnerable populations. And I'll tell you a little bit in a minute what those populations are. The really the mission for LSS or the their goals are the ones stated above. Uh, the first one is to stabilize individuals in times of crisis, which obviously is really important when we talk about refugees because they arrive at a time of crisis in their lives, right? Uh, the second one is to build a self-reliant foundation 
um, for um, individuals who are um, struggling with meeting their most basic needs. And then the second, the third, sorry, uh, sort of mission that they have is to preserve dignity and independence uh, during those times of crisis and for those vulnerable populations. Um, and each month, um, LSS serves 5,000 people, and they are also, I think they still are, uh, last time I talked to the CEO, she confirmed that, they're still uh, one of the biggest, or at least the b biggest employer in some of the southern counties in Arizona. So LSS is a pretty big organization in Arizona, if you haven't heard about them before. So they were founded in 1970. They were founded by um, a group of Lutheran churches who saw the issues in their community and saw the vulnerable populations that were surrounding them and they wanted to do something about it. Uh, so they got together and they created what was called at the time Lutheran Social Ministry of Arizona. Since and very quickly, uh, the organization became an organization on its own and it completely detached it itself from the Lutheran Church. Um, which means that today it's a nonprofit on its own, and even though it's kept the word Lutheran Social Services, it's a social services organization. The founding word Lutheran um, doesn't actually have to do with um, the faith at all. There are several points that they want me to make very clear to you is that our work is not bound by any particular faith or religion at all. We employ people from um, diverse backgrounds, regardless of their religious background. We serve anyone in need of help. It does not matter what their religious background is. We do not promote the Lutheran Church. We're not part of the Lutheran Church at all, even though we have volunteers from the Lutheran Church. But we have volunteers from uh, really all across the valley. So we don't promote that, especially among refugees, um, because religion is something, it's a very sensitive topic to refugees who have suffered from religious discrimination themselves. So we would never want to impose that on them. And then the last point is that our funding is actually I think it's something like 97% of it comes from the government. So it's not funded by the church at all. It's mainly um, the name, and then we've moved on completely from the actual faith group. So a little bit about the services that we provide. The first one is aging and disability services. So we serve adults who are senior members of the community or disabled members of the community by providing in-home and outside of the home uh, care services. Uh, and we do that, again, in seven different uh, counties. And really, the purpose is to provide them with that dignity and that independence that they can't provide from them for themselves because most of them live under the poverty level. Uh, the second uh, set of services that we provide is what we call emergency services. So that's mainly for homeless people people who live either on the street or below the poverty line, and we help them with um, lodging, with food, and with employment, so meeting their most basic needs. The third one is the children and family services, and again, it's for people who usually struggle economically or socially, and so we provide services for biological and foster care parents with different kind of community connections, um, financial help, emotional help, classes, etc. And then the one that we're most interested in today is the refugee and immigration services, which we will, what we'll talk about really mainly today. Um, so you may not know that, but the state of Arizona is the part of the top 10 resettling states in the United States, which means that we receive a lot of refugees here in Arizona. Um, other states receive a f a fewer than we do. And per capita, we are actually the state that resettles the most amount of refugees in the United States. So refugee work in Arizona is a big deal and something that's really important because it has an impact on our community. So to explain to you a little bit how it works, um, I'll walk you through the journey today of what the journey looks like for refugees from the time they are citizens in their own um, home, in their own nation, to the time they become a citizen here again in the United States. We'll, we'll go through that journey together. But to explain to you very quickly what, why LSS has anything to do with refugees, it's because um, each state has a number of agencies that are in charge of resettling refugees when they arrive in the United States. And in Arizona, there are four different agencies 
the IRC, Catholic Charities, and then the Refugee and Immigration Services, and then the Lutheran Social, Social Services of the Southwest. So we are one of the four resettling agencies, which means that we see refugees as soon as they arrive, and then we help them through that journey to kind of go on. Um, so first, before we begin with that journey that I'm telling you about, I want to first ask you, um, what do you think the definition of a refugee is? I think it's really important to kind of tackle the most basic principles before we delve into maybe more complex issues with refugees. Because I feel that most of the misunderstandings and misconceptions that people have about refugees comes from the fact that they don't even understand the most basic things about refugees. They don't even really understand who they are. So could anyone, um, Thank you. Give me a definition of what you think a refugee is. Well, I believe a refugee is not an immigrant. Thank you very much. You've stolen my next slide. <laughs> They're escaping something that's really horrible. That's exactly right. Anybody else? You repeat what he said. What's that? Repeat what he said. Oh, repeat, repeat what you said. Yes. You said that um, you believe that a refugee is not an immigrant. And you're well, not necessarily an immigrant. Not necessarily an immigrant. They're escaping something that's to them horrible. And they're escaping something that is to them horrible. You're absolutely right in that. Anybody else? That's a pretty good start, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the definition uh, that comes from uh, really uh, official documents. A uh, refugee is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. Lots of big words. What does that mean? It means that a refugee is an individual who because of a part of their identity that they cannot change or should not have to change on basis of basic human rights are fleeing their country. And for whatever reason, they choose not to stay in their country because either that country, that nation, um, is the body that's persecuting them or they fear that they will be persecuted by them. And so what do they do? They have to rely on the international community in order to find uh, protection. And so my next slide, which um, this gentleman has stolen from me, and I'm so glad, is this. What is the difference between an immigrant and a refugee? Somebody else. What do you think is the difference? And that's really important to understand. If you understand that, you understand really a lot of things about refugees. Yes, thank you at the back. Yeah, so the immigrants are moving voluntarily, not forced. They could still stay in their country safely in terms of the human rights purposes. Yes, so he said that immigrants are moving voluntarily. Um, that's exactly right. An immigrant is a person who comes into a country to take up residence and a person who chooses to go to another country. Of course, I've uh, put that word in bold and highlighted that because that is the main difference with uh, a refugee. A refugee is a person who is forced to flee their country for fear of persecution. And so the main point really, the difference between an immigrant and a refugee is one thing, it's choice. Yes, thank you. Could you also um, toss into this mix the word migrant? Because we hear that a lot yes. in, in the discussions of, um, involving the people that are fleeing migrants, they call them migrants. And they are. Anybody who migrates is a migrant. So would that cover both of those things? Uh, yes. So you're talking. You're saying, could you toss in there uh, migrants? Because we've been hearing a lot about migrants. Here, it's really semantics. Immigrants or migrants is really the same thing. Uh, an immigrant uh, is a person who's going to move to a different country. Um, a migrant is somebody who's come into the country. We're here, we're talking about directions, where you're going outside of your country or you're coming into the country. Um, we hear on the news migrants because they are people who have come to the United States, okay? Um, if you were to move to a different country, you would be an immigrant. Do you understand that? So it's the, it's, it's the, it's the direction that we're talking about here, whether you go outside of your country or you come into your country. But that does not really matter in our particular case. Yes, thank you. Uh, and so my question is then, uh, what you're really doing in this definition too is excluding the notion of economic refugees. 
Okay, so what do you 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 so you're talking about economic refugees? What right, do you right. mean? Like some people who talk about migrants is also uh, like another term that is sometimes used for them is economic refugees. That is people who are fleeing uh, for economic reasons. But that that's something that doesn't fit at all within the definition. Of right? um, I know that's good. I, I I bring that up only because there's a big discussion right now about, for example, all of the people that are fleeing from Central America <laughs> and whether or not they should be considered. You know what what they should be categorized. Okay, so you're saying, sorry, I have to repeat for the camera, you're saying that we're, we're tossing in there the word economic refugees, people who are fleeing their country because of economic reasons. Right, there are some people who use that term, yeah. Some people have used that term. Um, this is not the term that the UN uses. Um, the, the definition of a refugee, this is the official definition that is used by the UN. A refugee is someone who flees their country not because they are searching for economic opportunities. A refugee is somebody who flees their country because they are literally fleeing for their lives. Because if they stayed in their country, they or their children would most likely be killed. And so that is one very big misconception, that refugees are coming for economic opportunities. That is not what a refugee is. Uh, that is not the reason why they flee. And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, I actually had not heard the, the term economic refugee. To me, those, this is an oxymoron. Those two words do not work together because that is not what a refugee is. Yes, thank you. Well, there's the a tie-in when you said economic, that uh, 300 years of colonialism, it has to be considered whenever you raise the question of refugees. It's no coincidence that most of these people are brown, black, and Asian mm -hmm. because these are the countries where that were destroyed by Spain, uh, England, France, and Belgium, <laughs> right, and America as far as our current foreign policy. Can these things be factored in? Because they, they also they, they, they also include the economic uh, sanctions we bring against these countries. The, you know, destroying seven countries in five years in the Middle East. These, you know, um, they're fleeing their countries because of base foreign and economic policy by the first world countries. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly what you're saying, you're saying that uh, to a certain extent, those people have become refugees because of our historical background of colonization, and to a certain extent, we as French people, Americans, Western um, uh, nations, um, are partially responsible no, for... No, I didn't say partially, and I didn't say to a certain extent. We're absolutely <laughs> well, I am an advocate and I have to remain to a certain extent. You know, my personal opinion does not matter. I will tell you that my personal opinion completely uh, aligns with yours. But today I am a representative of Lutheran Social Services, an organization that does not care about what I think. So I will tell you, I will whisper it, I agree with you. But it does not matter. So thank you for bringing that up because people don't usually they fear to bring that up because it would make us responsible for something that's horrifying and we don't want to know that. We don't want to admit to that. So thank you for bringing that very controversial and true reality. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I just think it's important that we get a little bit of historical context here. And you know, the refugee uh, idea came out after World War II and it's really relatively narrow. And in addition to your point, um, you, you said his or her, but actually this was not written with some of the problems that women in the world face of, of terrible <coughs> domestic abuse, violence, and death. And it's been a really difficult thing for refugee accepting countries to kind of rethink this World War II era language in terms of the realities of today. And certainly, I don't think anytime soon these refugee accepting countries are going to get to the reality you're talking yeah. about. I mean, but I think I think by noting that this language comes out of you know 1950, it might really help this discussion a little bit. Okay, how do I you don't need to, how do I summarize this for the camera? <laughs> you don't need to do that. Okay, I don't need to. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. But uh, we can, of course, have a discussion about the flaws in the refugee program. There are so many, absolutely. Uh, but I think we also want to recognize that it's a good thing that there is a program because uh, it wasn't the case for a very long time. And so um, I think we're at least starting somewhere here um, with the program that has been put into place through the UN. 
but I agree that it's completely flawed and people are working towards making it, perfecting it. However, for that, we need the support of the international community, which we're not getting. So, uh, but thank you for pointing that out. And I'm glad you're talking about his and hers because I teach feminism and to me that's really important and that's why I put it in there even though it was not in there. So anyways, moving on, the idea of choice. Um, that's one of the very first misconceptions about refugees is that they are economic refugees. Thank you for bringing that, um, that um, sort of phrase up. Um, there is that tendency, especially in the US at the moment, to believe that refugees are coming here because they've chosen to. The reality is that refugees uh, flee from conflicts raging for decades. They flee from violence against religious and ethnic minorities, which they're usually part of. Um, they flee from political uh, instability and oppression within their own country. Um, and so the reality is that they have no choice but to become a refugee. And you also have to understand that not only do they begin with fleeing those things, but along the way they also lose um, their loved ones, they lose um, everything that they had built for themselves, and then they have really um, very little hope of ever returning home the way things are at the moment, at least. It doesn't mean that they never go back home. For some of them, they do, but the percentages are extremely low. Um, so as I always say, no one in their right mind would choose to become a refugee. This is not a choice. To, um, to, to think that is really not to understand what it means to be a refugee. The second misconception is we just talked about that, the idea that there is this tendency to believe that refugees um, are um, um, people who have come for better economic and social opportunities. Um, it doesn't mean that refugees who come to um, or develop countries, we'll pick the United States because that's where we are right now, it doesn't mean that they aren't glad for the opportunity to have uh, better economic and social opportunities. But it's also really misunderstanding the fact that those people had good opportunities and good social lives already in their countries. It's uh, kind of a really egotistical perspective in thinking that, well, they've come here to take our stuff. The reality is they don't really want your stuff. Uh, they actually prefer their own stuff that they had in their own country. And uh, they want to be here about as much as we want to go to their war-ridden country. So again, uh, thinking that they've come here to take our jobs because they want better opportunities is not realistic. It's not understanding where they come from. And then the third misconception, which is the most current one that we hear a lot about, and probably the most inaccurate one, is the fact that refugees are criminals. You'll understand later on why this is impossible. Uh, but really, the main reason why it's not the case, it's because, and I heard a pastor who is a former refugee, whatever that means, um, uh, who is an advocate himself for refugees now, and he said, really, we have been the victims of war and crime and all of those things that you see here. Why would we want to engage in that kind of life? Why would that be of interest to us when we have lost everything to that already? So that is the biggest misconception that we hear a lot about right now, which is really, again, not understanding where they come from. Oh, and I forgot one with persecu persecution with no end in sight, which really is the whole reason why they leave eventually. It's because they know it's just not going to stop. Okay, so what do the figures look like at the moment? Um, I think it's really important to understand that we are witnessing at the moment, I'm on record, and I appreciate that it may not be historically accurate, but obviously we have to live with our time with the current situation. So on record, since the UN, since internationally, we have been recording uh, the amount of refugees. On record, this is our witnessing the highest levels of displacement. This is the um, um, highest number of refugees that we have seen. It's unprecedented. There are 68.5 million displaced people in the world. And if you want to understand that a little bit, what the numbers are underneath, so there's my thing. right here, uh, the 40 million is people who are internally displaced. So what does that mean? That means people who had to leave their city, their region, and had to move to a different city or area within their own uh, country. As if we said, 
something is bombs are falling in Phoenix, we need to go south to Tucson, okay? So there are 40 million people who are displaced within their own country, which does not make it any less challenging. But today we are talking about externally displaced refugees, um, people, uh, individuals, and that's that number right here. It's 25.4 million people. If you think about it, that means that we're currently living in a world where nearly one person is forcibly uh, displaced every two seconds. That's unprecedented and it's really a huge number. It's very difficult to wrap your mind around that, that number, how, how huge um, that population is. Um, and in fact, for you to wrap your mind around it a little bit, oh, I think there is a typo on Phoenix, clearly. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's because it looks like it did not work properly. Philadelphia, sorry about the formatting. Anyways, you get it. That's more uh, than the populations of Phoenix, Tucson, San Diego, New York City, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Antonio, and Houston. And I have to tell you, I did not have enough room on that slide to add another city of about 4 million people. And every time I have updated this slide, I have had to make more room for more cities because the numbers just keep going up and up. Very soon, I'm thinking I'm gonna have to have two slides um, to demonstrate really how many people that represents. Um, so what does the population um, look like? Um, I think it's really also important to understand that the population of refugees that we think of, that 25.4 million people that we just talked about, um, half of them are people under the age of 18, which means that they are children. 51% of them are children. The rest of it, the majority of them are, or I, I should say a very big chunk of them are women which means that all in all, 80%, again, formatting didn't work, I'm sorry about that, 80% of refugees, of 25.4 million of those people, 80% um, are women and children, which means that you're um, already in a situation of vulnerability. You have people who are extremely vulnerable because they are being persecuted for whatever reason and they have to flee. And you toss into that the fact that 80% of that vulnerable population is made even more vulnerable by the fact that half of them are children who just cannot defend themselves. Uh, the other really big chunk of that are women. And you have to understand that in most of the countries the refugees uh, come from, they are strongly patriarchal societies where women have to a certain extent very few rights they are very often powerless socially politically economically and they are uneducated they are illiterate so um, really you're putting um, those millions of people in extremely vulnerable situations when they were already vulnerable to begin with yes thank you the uh, connection to saudi arabia and the women from africa and the middle east with the burkas and the acid being thrown in their face mm -hmm. and our undying support militarily for Saudi Arabia. The fact that they're the head of the UN Council of Human Rights now, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, uh, that, again, the responsibility, you know, the, the buck sort of stops with us because the greatest uh, perpetrator of violence against women in the world is Wahhabi, Wahhabism which is uh, promoted by Saudi Arabia. Yes, I could not agree more. But again, there are a lot of issues in the refugee program that do not take that into consideration. It's only very recently that the UN has started to put into place um, care packages for women. They've only started to understand that women biologically are different from men and have different needs. And so uh, women <laughs> have to really fend for themselves in the camps which meant that a lot of women died because of that. And it's only very recently that the UN has thought, oh, well, maybe we should do something about that. So there is now UN women, and they are now focusing on women and children a lot more than they have in the past. But yes, it does not mean that the program is not flawed. It, it is definitely flawed. But because it is an international body, we also have to definitely look at ourselves and how we consider women and how we consider um, um, how we have contributed to that. So thank you for pointing that out as well. I, again, could not agree more with that in the injustice of that, but, um, you know, I can't always say it, so. 
Okay, where do most refugees come from in the world? 57% of refugees in the world come from only three different countries. Of course, the biggest one right now is Syria. Um, I think actually the numbers are going up a little bit. But that was the most updated thing I could found on the, find on the UN uh, website. Um, obviously, we know that a huge chunk of the Syrian population has left. Um, so that, that's why mainly they're coming from Syria. Afghanistan, of course, and then South Sudan. That is where they come from um, at the moment, and obviously due to it, internal conflict mainly. Uh, where do most refugees go? So the world's um, displaced people, the numbers that we just um, reviewed, 85% of them go to developing countries, and those are the top um, uh, refugee hosting countries, though there are many other countries. Why do you foresee that as being an issue? The fact that 85% of uh, the world's refugees go to developing countries. They do not have the infrastructure for it. That's exactly right. Again, you are taking a vulnerable population of people and you are putting them in nations who are already vulnerable themselves socially, economically, and very often politically, which means that you're creating a situation that is just um, really, really unstable. So yes, that's a very big issue. And we'll review a little bit maybe why that is afterwards, why they go to developing countries. Um, where do refugees come from here in Arizona? Um, so they don't actually come from those three countries. Each state, uh, each country even, receives um, refugees from different countries because of, for a lot of different political reasons. Um, so where do they come from for us in Arizona? Right now, they come from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, mainly because of internal conflict that's been going on for a really long time in Congo. They come from Myanmar, the Rohingya people. Anybody has heard of the Rohingya crisis? Yes, can you tell me a little bit about it? Ethnic cleansing. Thank you very much. Ethnic cleansing, that's pretty much what it is. It's textbook genocide. Congress, I think it was maybe last year, maybe you guys know, uh, passed, thank goodness, though one of our congressmen did not vote for it, um, but passed uh, a bill that condemns the Rohingya ethnic cleansing, the, the genocide. Um, though not enough is being done at all. Um, they come from Eritrea and Ethiopia, again, because of internal conflict, Afghanistan, I think maybe you'll know a little bit more about that particular conflict. And those countries change all the time. <coughs> In the time that I've been doing this, we've seen them, we've seen an influx of them coming from different countries each time. Again, it's for a lot of different reasons, um, economic, social ones, but really mainly political ones, why some people come from some countries and then we never seem to see uh, others. Um, so, um, where do refugees um, go? So we saw that they go to really developing countries, but more specifically, where do they go? They go into refugee camps. 70% of the people who um, flee, who become refugees, live in refugee camps for at least 10 years. Can you tell me a little bit about what you know about life in refugee camps? It's bad. Definitely it's bad. How how bad? And I mean I think the picture kind of speaks for itself. Though this is a really bad picture and some of them do look better, but the reality is that it's not much better than that. So what do you think it looks like life in there? Okay, so I heard no running water, definitely no running water. What else did you say, sir? <laughs> Disease, absolutely. Um, medical facilities can be virtually non-existent. Medical supplies, yes, huge issues of sexual assault and rape. And unfortunately, very often it comes from um, UN or refugee organization employees themselves. The refugee does, the UN does not try to hide it. They clearly stated on their website that they are aware of what's going on, uh, but that they can't control cultures. Again, you have to understand that um, in refugee camps, people, um, um, you, you're dealing with extremely patriarchal structures, extremely strict ones, where women are viewed as worthless. And so where it's viewed as 
part of normal relationships to tell a mother, maybe a single mother of let's say three, if you want to eat, if you want to be referred for this thing, you have to sleep with me. That's the reality, right? So that's the reality of sexual assault, of dangers. Dangers still happen in refugee camps. Um, as you said, no uh, running water, no electricity. I remember hearing of a particular uh, family, people who came and they were resettled and they got an apartment and then when the case manager came back three days ago, three days later, sorry, to visit them, they had not been able to eat because they had never tur turned on a stove in their life. They did not know how to operate that because how do they cook? They cook, you know, with fire. Uh, with coal, whatever they have available. So we take those things for granted, but those people live without all of that for many years. Of course, there are many medical issues as well, and then there is very little education. Um, some refugee camps are extremely well organized, actually, amazingly organized. I think it's this year that there was a TED Talk put on by the, uh, one of the biggest refugee camps. I think it's in Kenya. Um, uh, so they, they, they have the possibility of educating others internationally, they have technology, but those are some of the uh, most well-organized camps. Most of them are not well-organized and they're exposed to everything that's there. And of course there is issues of exposure. You may have seen the UN always saying, winter is coming, please donate, we need more tents, we need more blankets. Um, it's because people are exposed to whatever it is. I mean, they've literally just found a piece of land and then the UN came in, they threw in tents, whatever they could, they barricaded, and here is the camp. And then you have to live like that for 10, 20 years, however long. I mean, some people live and die literally in, in refugee camps. So the, the situation is extremely dire in, in camps. Yes, thank you, ma'am. I think you had a hand up. Mm -hmm. Yes, did you have a question? Is there, I assume, a, a rate of infectious diseases. Could you estimate the approximate percentage? Okay, so you're asking about is there a rate of infectious disease in the camps and can I approximate that? No. Um, I have to tell you that in the refugee world, everybody has their specialty along that journey. Some people understand refugees when they flee. Some people are specialized in understanding really what's going on in camps and do research about that. Uh, some people uh, do more than when it comes to resettlement. I'm specialized in resettlement. Um, so I don't, I know about refugee camps from all of the research and the studies that I have done and from of course talking to refugees. Uh, but I don't know of the specific numbers. And um, also it, it's not like there is one rate of anything. All refugee camps are different because it's a messy, chaotic situation. Depending on the nation, depending on where they resettle, depending on how big it is, depending on how long the refugee camp stays up for, uh, the situations are all different in all of the different camps. That's why I said some of them are going to be up for just a few months and then they'll be able to move the people. Some of them will be there for years. Some of them are really well organized. Some of them are really terrible. Um, so no, I could not estimate, but I can definitely tell you from personal stories that I have heard that the medical conditions are pretty often very bad. But thank you for that question. Okay, so what do they do? They live in those camps. What do they do in those camps? They've escaped um, their nation, their situation, and then they finally arrived to a camp. Um, I have to tell you that the journey to camps is very harsh and that very often people settle in the camps because they have heard that uh, a camp is being created. You know, let's say we were all to flee Phoenix right now and we've heard that the uh, UN has intervened and had just put up a particular camp south of Tucson or whatever. This is where we would all go. This, this is how it happens. They all go to one particular camp. Of course, most of them think this is just a transition. Uh, but the reality is that for a lot of them, it's a really long transition. So what do they wait for? There are three possible solutions to get out of the camps if people survive. Okay, that's really important to note that. The first one is voluntary repatriation to their home. What does that mean? That means that most refugees, all refugees that I have met, when given the choice, will always go back home, right? We can understand that. 
if you could go back home to everything you've built, you would go back home, right? That would be the absolute ideal situation. Um, so if they're given the choice, people will go back home. They will be repatriated to their home country, to the country that they fled in the first place. Uh, and the UN helps refugees um, a lot with that, with going back to their country. They help them psychologically, emotionally, depending on what they've lived through. And then they help them physically by providing them with shelter, money, vouchers, whatever else, systems to rebuild their lives. However, in order for people to go back home, um, the conflicts need to have stopped completely and a peace agreement needs to have been put into place. They will never send people back home um, if that has not been uh, put into place first. However, let's be realistic. What do you think the challenges of repatriation can be? So I hear a lot of whispers. <laughs> the new regime is not going to want them back. Okay, very good. The new regime may not want them back. If they kick them out in the first place, let's say the Rohingya people, how likely is it that the Rohingya people are gonna be welcomed back into Myanmar in six months? It's very unlikely, unless the political system has been completely overturned. This takes decades, which means that for most people, it is not an option to live in camps for decades. They need to find something else. They need to abandon the reality the, the thought that they will ever go back home. So absolutely, that may not be a possibility. What else? Yes. Their neighbor probably moved into their house and stole all their stuff. <laughs> yes, their neighbors may have acquired their belongings. And that happened in Bhutan, which is where I actually, at Oxford, that's where I, I, that's the population I did my work with. The difficulty is that in Southern Bhutan, they, I'll, I'll just finish my thought and then I'll ask, I'll, ask you after. But um, in southern Bhutan, uh, there was ethnic cleansing just like it's happening in genocide, just like it's happening with the Rohingya people. So the people left, went to Nepal, and lived in refugee camps for, in Nepal for a really long time. And then the few people who were able to come back, well, the reality is that the dominant ethnicity had taken over their homes. And they had obviously made sure to legalize that by signing papers. And also, very often, um, we see that in that particular refugee crisis, but we also have heard of that in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with Palestinian <laughs> refugees, um, where men have been tortured into signing a paper that says that they abandon their property. And so they have nothing to come back to. And then the last point is exactly that. They have nothing to come back to. Everything has been destroyed. If you think of bombings, there are no schools left. There are no buildings left standing. There are no homes. And how do you work? How do you send your children to school? How do you find shelter for yourself if there is nothing left but rubble? You don't. It's not an option. So you can't go back home. Yes, thank you. Um, I, the one guy up there, he said that the neighbors steal their stuff. Yeah. And then you said they acquire. Um, and then you don't like the youth choice of my word. No, I don't. And then okay, there, was the, there was the other issue of you know that you know if women have you know no rights or fewer rights, and you say you know to a certain extent, it's not to a certain extent, and it's not friggin' acquiring. They stole their stuff, and they're mistreating people. You know? Yes. It, and it's, it's, I, I, I don't know if it's because of the place you work for. No, it's because I'm an anthropologist and I also always have the duty to see things from somebody else's perspective. It doesn't mean that I respect it, but it means that I have to understand it. I have to understand all perspectives in such a challenging political situation as a refugee situation is. So, I'm sorry, this is why I'm, I'm an anthropologist. I will always see things from everybody's perspective. My own opinion, it's different, but that's not what I'm here for. Okay. So, but I'm glad because if I were in your seat, I would also say that, but I'm not today. Thank you. This is not new behavior of people. I mean, yeah. uh, no. <laughs> we did it in the United States well, in the 1940s. In this country, when they started moving people out and acquiring their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I, I, you know, so. Well, their land, their knowledge, I mean, their, anyway, I can't put all the blame 
on the people who feel or acquire when other people leave, they are probably as destitute and unable to leave for whatever reason. You know, yeah. grandma is dying and they can't That's a good point. leave her. I mean, it's and happening in Israel, it's Palestine. I mean, it's human and we have to change humanity. And you also have to understand that for a lot of people, they stay because they really can't come to the realization that this is really happening to them, you know? I mean, it's just like, total side note. But you see those people who get those warnings in Florida. A hurricane is coming, a hurricane is coming, a hurricane is coming, leave, leave, leave. And they're like, it's not going to be that bad. And then you hear them on the news, everything was destroyed. I didn't think it was going to be that bad. The refugee situation very often is like that. Would you come to the realization that your people are being literally murdered for the color of their skin right away? Some people do, but some people don't because they just cannot come to the realization that horrifying things are happening to them to that extent. Yes, thank you. What about those people who they realize it but are physically unable Absolutely. to leave? And once you hit 60, 65, in many cases, younger, you cannot get out by yourself. Yes, you're saying that. What about those people who can't leave? And that's the reality. A lot of people stay because they are either physically unable to go. I mean, you have to realize that in a lot of cases, refugee populations are people who are already, as you were saying, destitute. They are already very impoverished people. They're not people who have a car. They're not people who have a minivan. They're not people who have the money to go and get a flight ticket. Uh, that's not their reality. What, what do they have? What is the only thing that they have? Their, their legs. They only have their legs to take them as far as it will. And so for some of them, they have elderly people who do not even have wheelchairs. It's a luxury in most um, underdeveloped countries. And they also have little children. So um, that's the reason why a lot of people don't leave and never even make it to the camps. I have to move on. I think I'm going to go over. Um, second, I'm sorry. It looks like the formatting really didn't work. Second solution is integration into the country that they fled into, the country that is hosting them right now where their camps are. So many refugees are unable to stay within the camps for whatever reason, or they just do not want to stay in the camps anymore because the situation in the camps is just too horrible. Um, so what do they do? They hope that the um, country that is hosting them will allow them to be integrated into that society and that they will be able to obtain the same rights as people who live there. What are the challenges that you can foresee in that? Language. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Yes. Garden variety xenophobia. Absolutely. In a lot of cases, uh, people will not accept them because they have the same um, discriminatory beliefs as their neighboring country. Um, so they won't accept them, they won't provide them with any rights, and if they do very often, um, it's really kind of a joke, uh, which means that they have very little rights. So that's an issue. Also, some neighboring countries may just not be able to economically. I mean, if you think that some of the biggest camps are about 350,000 people, that's a lot of people to take in for a nation that's usually a developing nation themselves. They just do not have the economic possibilities to do that. And then there are also political reasons. If your neighbor kicked out an entire portion of the population for whatever um, political reason, um, they may hesitate to say, well, you didn't take them, but we're going to take them if they have communicating or similar borders, right? Yes, thank you in the back. Um, is uh, education for the re refugees part of the uh, uh, part of the problem in integration into a society since they're often coming from a position of not having uh, maybe access to that education? Does that pose a problem with the integration? So you're asking if education is a problem with local integration. Um, it is. That's, again, another topic. 
it definitely is for the children who integrate into that local community and we see that happening a lot here in the US. However, you would be amazed at how resilient children are and how quickly they can pick things up. I mean, they survived a refugee crisis. They can learn a new language and they always do. Um, so it's not one of the main reasons why countries would not welcome them into their country. They're really not worried about actually what happens to this refugee population. It's mainly for political and economic reason whether they would take people or not, but that's a good point that you're making. I don't know if I really answered your question. But I was thinking from the refugee perspective. From themselves, from the refugees. Um, to be honest, the refugees, as long as they have a safe place to call home and they can be integrated into a society where they're not going to be hunted and where they're going to have rights, uh, they'll take anything at that point. So yes. And then the third option, which you can't see because the formatting did not work and it's hiding behind the pictures, is third country resettlement. Um, so a third country resettlement is what um, I'm more specialized in, and that means where refugees can either return to their home or be integrated into the local community. And so the only option that they have is to go to a third country, another external country, in order to uh, be resettled permanently and to have a permanent uh, solution, sorry. So what are the challenges with that? Um, the challenge is, I'll move on because I don't have a whole lot of time left, I think. The main challenges are that um, it's very difficult to obtain. Um, there are only 34 countries in the world who accept refugees, which seems like a lot, but actually it's very little. Um, also, there's that myth that you, know, you can come to the United States as a refugee and it's really easy. Well, it's not easy at all for so many reasons. The first one is that refugees can actually not apply for resettlement themselves. It's not like applying for a visa. You don't do that willingly. You just pay and you get the visa. That's not how it works. You have to be referred by the UNHCR or by uh, another refugee agency in order for you to first be accepted into the resettlement program. How are you accepted? You have to be part of one, one of those vulnerable categories. Either there is urgent medical needs, because of course, as we just talked about in the camps, the medical conditions are so horrific that a lot of them have those needs. <coughs> Women and girls are at risk of um, sexual violence, um, sexual sex trafficking, etc. gang rape, we've talked about that a little bit. There are survivors of violence and torture themselves, and then there are children at risk. If you're meeting one of those vulnerable categories, then the UN or one of the agencies will refer you. Then after you've been referred, you need to have one of those 34 countries that will accept you. And those 34 countries have their own criteria, selection criteria themselves. So it may very well be that Germany will say, I will take the Mohammed family. And then for the exact same reasons, the United States says, we will not take the Mohammed family. So they will be selected by Germany. Uh, also, the other uh, reason why it's a complete misconception that refugees are criminals is because since it works on a referral basis, um, the UN and countries themselves will never refer somebody who has a past as a criminal. There would be, it would make no sense for them to do that. Um, so that's just not how people, that's just not who comes through. Um, so refugee processing and vetting in the United States, how does it work? Let's say that they were referred by the UN and the United States said, okay, they meet our criteria. Um, how does it work? Well, it works like this. It's a very complex chart, as you can see, and it's very lengthy. Uh, it can take up to anywhere from 18 months to three years for them to go through all of the um, processes. Uh, and also along the way, it's important to remember that their case can be put on hold indefinitely or they can be denied. So you can have started the process and then you can just be completely denied and then may have to start all over again or maybe you'll just never be picked. Um, so for the US, it looks like this. So they have all of that, this chart, and then this is what they go through. And you'll understand why also the idea that criminals come through is not realistic. <coughs> Uh, the immigration process includes health assessments, scans, fingerprints, facial scans, security checks from eight U.S. government agencies, 
six separate security <coughs> databases, five background checks, and three in-person interviews. So it's a very selective um, process, and it's, again, very unlikely that criminals would come through. Once you have made it through that, um, once it's all said and, said and done, it means that there are only very few refugees in the world who actually get resettled. What do you think the percentage is? Five percent. One percent. Yes? When you say criminals, uh, if you're a uh, person who was a uh, political prisoner or persecuted by an unjust government, would that count as a criminal? No, it's a very good question because you are deemed as having been one of those vulnerable categories where you were tortured. Um, so no, you would not be deemed as a criminal. That's a really good point. You would be in that vulnerable category, that category of people who needs additional assistance because of what you lived through. Okay, it's less than 1%. Last time I checked, it was 0.08%. Which means that really, uh, the refugees that you see here are an absolute walking miracle. The fact that they survived the conflicts, they went through all of that journey, then they were picked by two different bodies, the UN, then the country, then they went through all of those checks, and finally they make it here. They are walking miracles. You said 0 0.08. Yes. That's less than 0.1%. Less than 0.1%. Quite a bit less than 0.1%. I agree. Okay. But if I tell people that, they're like, wait, hold on, I don't get it. So if I say less than 1%, people are like, okay, that's very little. Uh -huh. Yeah, last time I checked, it was 0.08%. It was in 2017 that how many had been resettled. Yes. You can do math in this room. You can do that. I'm so glad. Remember, I teach uh, kids who are just out of high school, and our education system is really bad here. So, uh, yes. Yeah. What happens to the other 99% that are here? Um, very good question. What happens to them? <laughs> I'm out of time. Um, I have five minutes left. Okay. We have time for questions after. Okay, uh, what happens to them? Some of them die, they just never make it. Some of them are resettled into their country. The percentage is very small, though I think it was in 2015 that three million Afghan people went back to Afghanistan, so that's a really good thing. So a small percentage of them go back to their home country. A small percentage of them, I, would, I try to find percentages and it's impossible to find that. Um, I just can't find it. Um, some of them, again, are integrated. Some of them are come here into the U.S. or whatever resettling country. The rest continue to live in the camps. Some of them die in the camps. Uh, and the reality is that the rest we don't know yet because the refugee crisis that's happening at the moment on record is unprecedented. So we do not know what will happen with all of those people because we have never seen that. So those are the figures that we have for the, from the last decades. I'm sorry, I have to move on. I will take your questions afterwards when we have a little bit of time. What does LSS do as people when they come here? They are here, they are this walking miracle, and we as an agency take them on. What do we do? We set up their apartment. Before they arrive, we pick them up at the airport with a case manager who often is himself or herself, a former refugee that speaks their language and understands their background. We provide initial food and clothing. For the first three months, their apartment is paid for and their flight tickets are paid for, though they, are, uh, they have a debt to the US government. They have to repay that, it's not free. Uh, we lead US cultural orientation because the culture clash, believe it or not, is one of the hardest things that they have to deal with. Um, we help them find their first job. They are, it's mandated that will, they will take any first job. Otherwise, there's the threat that they will lose their benefits, which again is very difficult for a lot of reasons. Sign up for government benefits, which is also limited and has restrictions on. Sign up for English classes. The men speak English a lot better than the women, which is why I do most of my research with women because they are the most vulnerable population. We enroll children in school. Uh, we take them to family doctors, whatever appointments that they have to have, something that's completely foreign to them for a lot, in a lot of situations. And that assistance can continue up to five years. However, the reality is that most of them do not take those services for up to five years. 
Uh, there is a women's empowerment program also in with LSS because uh, we understand that they are the most vulnerable population. Intensive case management program that is meant for people who have been victims of rape or torture. Uh, children's after school and summer programs because it's expected, expected that both mother and father will work, which means somebody has to take care of the children when they're out of school. And then immigration services we provide because they need to understand what their rights are now as new um, not quite American citizens yet, but uh, people who live in the United States. So the current situation, I'm gonna go through this in like literally two minutes. The current situation is really bad. Um, at the moment, you may not know that, but in the US, not only you have all of those limitations, but there's also a cap, a number. You can only welcome so many refugees into the US. Each country is different, but the US, they determine that every year, we call that the presidential determination. It's decided every October. It was just decided this month. That's how the fiscal year works. The president decides that each year. In 2016, we did really well. We said we would welcome 85,000 people. We almost did that. In 2017, the Obama administration realized that the crisis is unprecedented and we need to do more. It is our um, responsibility, as you were saying. It is our responsibility. He realized that. Unfortunately, what happened in January, the new um, administration came in and they stopped arrivals for refugees for three months because they said we can't let criminals in. Then they put a ban on and then they've reduced the numbers, which means that we only welcomed about half of them. This year, the cap was the lowest it has ever been seen in the history of the refugee program in the US. 45,000, we only actually welcomed half of that. This is the cap, 45,000. This year, it was just announced that they will only allow 30,000, but there's no way to know how many they will actually welcome. The situation is bad. Next issue with that is that they have added vetting uh, measures, stricter measures for 11 countries. You may know that as the Muslim ban. Those countries in among that, those 11 countries, two of them, if you'll remember, are Syria and South Sudan, which is where 57% of the refugee population comes from, which means no one from those countries are coming in. Because they're asking for that information, places where you have lived in the last 10 years, and then the addresses and telephone numbers for all close relatives. Um, it's really unrealistic to expect that for people who have fled with literally nothing but the clothes on their back. They cannot provide that, so no one is coming in. The consequences of that are that not only are refugees not being literally rescued, but people who have arrived here uh, have seen their family members who are still in the camps because, believe it or not, you don't actually always get resettled with your loved ones. Um, they, their family members are left in the camps. They cannot come through. They have seen their, um, their um, application being denied or put on hold indefinitely. And then also the consequence of that is that a lot of refugee agencies have closed and people have lost their jobs because there is just no work. No refugees are coming in. And the issue with that is that the agencies and the people, the workers, are refugees themselves, former refugees themselves. So it's people along all of that journey that are being affected. Okay, how can you be involved? Yes, silver lining. Let me pass around this. There are three options here if you want to get involved. You don't have to, but you can. Um, you can come and see a tour. Um, that will tell you a little bit about the work that we do, if you're just interested in seeing what it looks like in real life. Um, you can um, ask to receive a list of volunteer opportunities, what you can do, and I'll tell you in a minute. And then you can also to receive um, our advocacy email updates. I send that, I do the advocacy. We advocate through policy, by going to DC, by telling people about uh, why we think that refugees are important and the administration is not liking us right now, but you can still receive our emails about it. What are the volunteer opportunities? You can mentor a refugee. You can teach English if you are a teacher and you love that. You can teach them English. You can do administrative work, believe it or not. Some people are just not comfortable being, I don't know, in the thick of things, but we need people to do that kind of work to continue um, the work that we're doing. You can welcome a refugee family. You can make that first contact. Tell them, 
how to buy grocery, how their health insurance works, how all of those things that are just so foreign to them. You can be that first friend. You can do advocacy. This is the work that I do, call and write to elected officials, and of course you can always donate. It's not just about donating money. We need things for kids, you know, we need clothes, we need um, things for the children who arrive, etc. So uh, there is a list of donations as well that you can, you can, um, I can give you if you would like. And then you can come and view our, uh, come and see to where I meet our CEO, who is an amazing woman. And this is Dragon, the um, uh, the executive director of the refugee office. He, he is a former refugee from Kosovo himself. All right. I'm sorry I take too much, took too much of your time. <laughs> <laughs> Five or six minutes right. for, some, for some questions. Please raise your hand because I want to get the microphone to you. Question about lectures. Oh, <laughs> yes. can you hear that? Yeah. Hello. Question. I'm uh, confused because I hear about uh, really a lot of people coming to the border and we have to let them in to go to some kind of court proceeding to determine if they're refugees. But you're saying that they would have to have some kind of permission slip from the UN to get that recognition. Is someone giving them those permission slips? Well, that's a really complex issue here. Um, so it's not really a permission slip. You have to be declared a refugee. Those are what we call asylum seekers, right? You've all heard of asylum seekers. So they come into a country and they're saying, I'm being persecuted for whatever reason. I need the refugee status. Then through the UN, this country would allow them, would grant them that refugee status. The issue of the people coming through the border is vast and everybody has their opinion on it. Um, but there are people who, yes, are fleeing a different form of conflict in their home country. Most of them, we actually participated in the reunification of the children and the parents who, have been, who had been um, separated at the borders, we participated in that. And uh, most of them came from Honduras and they, their difficulty is that they are being persecuted by gang violence in their country. So whether they would qualify as refugees under the international convention, um, that would not be for me to decide, but that's why it's a very controversial and difficult topic. It's because some people think that they're here because they've targeted the US because they want that economic life. Some people understand that they're actually fleeing horrors in their own country. But then they are like, well, yeah, but they don't really qualify as refugees. And then some people are saying, well, we don't care. They're literally fleeing for their lives with their children, and we need to help them. So there are different opinions along the spectrum. And they, even though they are asylum seekers, they have not been granted the refugee status. So I don't know if this is answering your question in any way. It seems like they should never get through the border then. Personal opinions on that. All right, right here, we have to move along yes. again. I, I understand that uh, LSS, Lutheran Social Services, has just moved to a new location yep. uh, on University in about seven? Yeah, right next to the airport. Near the airport. Could you, is it open and is are, uh, are you willing to take visitors yet? Okay, so um, this week uh, we are moving and then we're doing uh, come and see tours again. I think starting beginning of November. I just had Hannah, the person who takes care of those, on the phone yesterday, and she said that we are we're going to start doing tours again beginning of November. But if you are interested, absolutely sign up for it, and then I'll be happy to uh, be there and give you a tour, and you'll be able to meet Connie, and you'll we'll, you'll see the new facilities. Absolutely. Okay. Any other question? Any other questions? Okay. All right, can we have a nice round of Thank applause? You. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we have a tradition here at the Union Society to mug our speakers. Oh, I'm scared. Uh -huh. Okay, so, I thought you were going to hit the or something. Mug thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and Charlotte has to leave after work to take care of her family, but she will be here for a few more minutes yes, if you absolutely. want to come up and speak to her. Yes. Al and Alex, I would love to speak okay. to you about Thank you again, Charlotte. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Please give another round of applause for Charlotte.
I'm sure we're all going to leave a little more informed than we uh, arrived, and I think that's something that we always appreciate here. Uh, these types of events are uh, the way. The reason we're able to hold these types of events is through not only donations, financial donations, but the hard work and dedication of our volunteers. We need as much help as we can get. We'd like to expand our capacity and our ability to serve uh, not only each other, but uh, others who have not yet visited. So um, please donate. Um, so next Sunday speaker uh, meeting is Ethical Automation, not an oxymoron, by Sean Capehart and Jetty Vanderveen. Two, mem two uh, very, very new members to us, and we're very excited about that. It's going to be pretty cool. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, introduce them to some other people that I uh, come across. Uh, but the topic is from self driving cars to auto composed text re uh, replies. As automation becomes increasingly present in our day to day lives, there's a generation that is starting a movement to address its in inevitable impact. It's, it's uh, Sunday, uh, two weeks from now, on November 4th. Breakfast starts at 9. Uh, the talk begins at 10. Please do join us, and uh, that's pretty much it. Also, this is recorded, and uh, unfortunately, we could not live stream today, but it is recorded and will be going up on YouTube. Um, we do have a Patreon where some of our equipment is in a little bit of need of help. That Patreon goes towards our ability to record and get this information out, not only to our uh, members, but also to the world. That this is something that is, is a service that we provide to everybody. So if you sign up on, uh, not only on YouTube, subscribe to our channel, give, give us a like, but also sign up on Patreon, help us uh, in, improve our capacity. Um, we do